Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We're gonna be going through the double AMC Cars Passage 2 today. Okay, so first things first, let's look at the uh, title. It's called Dolly. That tells us uh, basically nothing, so whatever, sometimes that happens. Starts out, it says, Salvador Dali was a painter who, by persistently making a spectacle of himself, focused attention more on his personality and less on his artistic performances. Okay, uh, so basically Salvador Dali, painter with personality. They were not, in the eyes of innumerable people, interested in art, the ultimate end of all his efforts, but the stage set on which he struck an attitude like some fascinating actor. Okay, so I get, um, I get the vibe that, um, you know, Dolly is making a spectacle of himself and that's not necessarily who he is, but it's just kind of the stage that he sets his work on or something like that. I'm not really sure. People were used to seeing him in the guise of a great eccentric, indulging endlessly in scandalous pronouncements and amusing turns rather than paintings. Okay, so now I'm getting, I'm getting kind of strange vibes. I'm getting like, maybe he's a little too eccentric for the author's liking. Dolly was the man who landed in New York for the first time, holding a roll of bread eight feet long, who appeared in public in a suit sewn over with artificial flies, who delivered lectures dressed in, uh, in a diving suit, and arrived in a Rolls Royce filled with cauliflower, who made countless declarations on the radio and television about grooming his famously long mustache. Okay, so a bunch of examples to kind of get us where the author is, you know, we don't have to come in knowing anything about Salvador Dali or painting or art at all. Um, but we're told, you know, holding a bread, a roll of bread, eight feet longer, having a Rolls Royce filled with cauliflower, um, just kind of gives us the vibes that the author is setting this passage on. All right. It says a great many people, no, hold on. Behavior like this guaranteed a reputation as brilliant as it was misleading. Okay. Now we're seeing the author in here. We're seeing the author in that statement. Um, we're getting the vibes that, you know, that behavior gave him a reputation that was perceived by the public. And I think the author is saying that it's misleading. And I think maybe the author is setting up something where they're going to talk about, um, who Dolly truly was. Again, this is just speculation. It's things I have working in my mind while I'm reading through. A great many people have been taken in by it. Later in life, Dolly himself regretted this misunderstanding and said, the day when people take my work seriously, they will realize that my painting is like an iceberg, which only shows a tenth of itself above the water. Okay, so now, you know, we have this working main idea in our head. Dolly's a painter. He does all these spectacles, but it's really not who he is. It's kind of just the stage he sets his work on. In fact, behind the good-natured buffoon who amused some and exacerbated, exasperated others, there lay an, an, an admirable creator. Dolly was, before anything else, a man possessed by painting. You see how this is like a straight-up just statement. That is something that the author is saying. It, the author's not saying... Oh, some people liked him. Some people didn't. Some people saw him as, you know, a little too out there. The author is saying that he was, before anything else, a man possessed by painting. There was even fairly convincing proof that this frivolous and exuberant impresario, impresario was capable of the strictest asceticism while he was painting a picture. That was so many words that I don't know. Um... <laughs> But context clues, let's kind of roll with it. So, we get that he amused some and exas exasperated others. Um, but that little paragraph to me did not add like a whole much more to my main idea that I have working in my head. However, we should avoid the other extreme and in interpret him and not dissociate the artist too categorically from the circus performer. His provocative attitudes were not adopted for publicity purposes only. Okay, so obviously they were a little bit. But satisfied a need to keep his mind in a state of excitement that would be congenial to his artistic activity. 
They were useful too in winning immediate acceptance for his most fantastic works because their extravagances appeared to illustrate an intellectual drama. Okay, so obviously Dolly did all these weird cauliflower and Rolls Royce things for publicity purposes, but also, you know, to be one of those artsy people that kind of have their mind in a very creative state. He just kind of like purposely put himself there. Um, we got some pretty interesting language here. The author calls Dolly a circus performer um, and also says his attitudes were provocative. So those are um, really descriptive words, I guess, that we need to pay attention to. So much subversive good humor led him to surrealism and he flung himself into it with complete abandonment. Okay, so now Dolly, we didn't know what kind of art he did before, but now we know he's flinging himself into surrealism. The members of the movement welcomed him in Paris as an unhoped for recruit. Oh, so they didn't like him. Dolly seized on the guiding principles of surrealism and gave them their most extreme interpretation. He transformed its interest in the revelations of the unconscious and psychopathological states into a way of living and thinking. Okay, so it sounds like Dolly is pushing the walls and the boundaries of what surrealism really is. Like maybe he fit into surrealism better than he fit into anything else, but at the same time, he's still having to like push those boundaries to really express himself the way he wants to. He invented the paranoiac critical system, a real delirium of organized interpretation, which consists of cultivating his hallucinations and putting himself into a state of feigned madness in order to create without losing his lucidity. Okay, the only difference between a madman and me is that I am not mad, Dolly declared. So I can see some students getting kind of mixed up with this and, and thinking that maybe Dolly is like crazy or, um, you know, that he's having these hallucinations and he's creating these uh, psychopathological states. And I don't think that that's what the author is saying. I think the author is saying that he kind of forced himself to think in these ways uh, so that he could kind of come up with this like outlandish style of art that he was, you know, famous for. Um, all his phobias and his obsessions were flaunted in his behavior and his work and demonstrated that the artist, for the same reasons as a child, was not responsible for his instincts. His fantastic imagination, which was so fertile and its dazzling inventions ended by worrying the Surrealist group. So the author thinks that Dolly has a fantastic imagination um, and had dazzling inventions, but now we get the uh, kind of opinion of the Surrealists that they didn't really like him. Um, it overstepped the mark and even invited the public to make fun of the movement's convictions. Still, while Surrealism rejected Dolly, Dolly continued to represent surrealism for a large part of the public. Indeed, the aim behind his work was always the search for the unforgettable. Future generations will only forget what Dolly did if they forget the history of modern painting itself. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to start recapping the whole passage. So, I don't, I don't know. I always like to scroll up to the very top and read the first sentence again. That's just a personal thing. It kind of helps me to bring it full circle to figure out where I need to go in my memory, I guess, to kind of start creating that main idea. Okay, so yeah, we had that first main idea that Salvador Dali is a painter with a personality. And yes, but now we have all this other stuff. We have how the author feels about Dali. We have how the surrealists feel about him uh, and the public, how they feel about him. So, and also a little bit about like Dolly himself, his own opinions about his behavior and his regrets and things like that. So, um, overall, if I was going to kind of encompass all of it into a main idea, I'd say something like that Dolly was an extraordinary artist, um, often overshadowed by his eccentric personality, but that represented surrealism for the public while rejected by other surrealists for being too radical. So I know that that's a lot and it's kind of long, but there was a lot of like conflicting ideas in this passage. Remember when we're making a main idea, like we always want to put ourselves in the author's shoes. So I see it all the time. I'll ask a student for a main idea and they'll say, you know, for this passage, for instance, they'll say, um, 
Well, the author was saying that Salvador Dali, um, you know, was kind of weird and had these weird, um, you know, paintings and uh, he was in surrealism. And I get it. Like, I think that truly it's probably not that big of a difference to say it from a third person perspective versus the author's perspective. But I find it so much more helpful to really put myself in the author's shoes and to start my main idea as if I am the author and I have 10 seconds to say everything that I said in this big passage. You know, the author obviously cared about it enough to write this passage. So if they had 10 seconds to say in an elevator, what's the main idea of this passage and try to get all of the big ticket arguments in there um, and not change the main idea at all by, by leaving any arguments out, then that's what I would say. As far as the tone goes for this passage, I, f I get the vibe that the author does care about Salvador Dali in a way um, and cares more than just about his bizarre um, spectacles that he made of himself or um, more about what he represented in surrealism and actually does care about all the, all the ins and outs of who he was as a person and why he did what he did. So... I, the tone is caring. I don't, I don't really know how to sum that up in just one word, but um, I am like thinking about how the author feels about that the entire time I'm reading. Let's go to the first question. Um, it says, which of the following is an assertion that is supported by strong evidence in the passage? Okay, so, um, you know, in a way, this is a main idea question. It's probably an aspect of the main idea is going to be the correct answer choice. So let's look for that. A says surrealists were all as eclectic and scandalous as Dolly. So we have straight up passage evidence that says that the surrealists didn't really like him. Like they thought that he was like way too far. So that's not supported. Dolly will be remembered for his paintings long after other artists are forgotten. So this is an attractive answer choice because of this last sentence right here. Future generations will only forget what Dolly did if they forget the history of modern painting itself. But let's look closely at the language, okay? B says Dolly will be remembered for his paintings long after other artists are forgotten. So basically, he's much more memorable than other artists. The last sentence says future generations will only forget what Dolly did if they forget the history of modern painting itself. So that's saying that Dolly has made his mark on modern painting. Um, that's saying two different things, but I can still see how B could be kind of correct. So I'm going to say maybe on it. C, Dolly was capable of total focus when painting. So... I, I don't really think it talked about, you know, this state of feigned madness that he had while he was painting or um, this like paranoia or delirium of organized interpretation. Um, so I just don't, none of that tells me that he was super focused. Like it doesn't tell me that he was unfocused. It just doesn't really tell me anything. And the word total is very strong and so I want very good passage evidence to be able to click that answer. D. Dolly's bizarre public actions had rational causes. So that is definitely something that was in our main idea and it's something that was talked about up here. You know, it says that they were adopted for publicity purposes and also to keep his mind in that kind of um, paranoia, you know, delirium state so that he could create these crazy spectacles. So I think that D is the right answer, um, and I think that uh, D is stronger than B, because B is just not the exact language. If you kind of compare those two statements, they are saying slightly different things. All right, the second question says, given the passage discussion of Dolly and the Surrealists, which of the following uh, works of art would be most reasonably considered to be Surrealist? Okay, so... Um, we know that Dolly represented surrealism for the public. Um, so this, this question is essentially asking like what would, you know, kind of go hand in hand with what we know about Dolly's paintings. 
The passage didn't tell us anything about like what the surrealists did. It only said what Dolly did, and it said that Dolly represented surrealism in a way. So that's what we're going to go off of. Um, a says an abstract sculpture that demonstrates the calming effects of symmetry. To me, that does not at all go with surrealism. Surrealism, like, you know, what Dolly did was crazy. It had nothing to do with the calming effects of symmetry. Like, he literally put himself into a paranoid state of feigned madness. So, I don't think that that's correct. B says a painting that renders an artist's anxiety with seemingly unrelated objects. So now you see like the word anxiety and that kind of goes a little bit hand in hand with like those psychopathological states that they were talking about when they mentioned Dolly and the seemingly unrelated objects. Um, hello, cauliflower and Rolls Royce. Like I can see how this answer choice would work. So I'm going to put a maybe. C, a painting that demonstrates the skill of an artist to recreate a scene with detail. So that, definitely not, right? That would be more like... Um, I don't know that much about art, but like um, hyper-realism or whatever it's called where, you know, people are like painting things that end up looking like a picture, like it's that detailed. Um, I don't think that that's what Dolly was really caring about. He wasn't like super high-key on the details and all that kind of stuff, at least from what I get from the passage. So I didn't really like that. D says a newsworthy photograph by an eccentric journalist that is regarded as controversial. Okay, um, so I think that this is wanting you to pick this answer choice because it says an eccentric journalist. Um, but overall, it doesn't say anything that the photograph was eccentric. It says that the photograph is controversial. And yes, Dolly was controversial himself, but we're not talking about Dolly himself. We're talking about Dolly's art and surrealism. So, um, you know, we're not giving a whole, we're not given a whole lot of information about what the photograph actually is of or anything like that. And so I think it's going to be more along lines with B. The next question says the author's apparent attitude towards Dolly's strange behavior in public, um, is that it was, okay, let's brainstorm this idea before we even look at the answer choices. Um, this is asking about the author, the author's attitude, and we should be pretty keen on the author's attitude towards everything that they talked about in the passage. Like that, I want y'all to pay attention to that when you're going through any of these cars passages. Um, so his strange behavior in public. What did it say about that? It said it was for publicity purposes and also to keep himself in a um, state of feigned madness, that it was misunderstood, that Dolly kind of regretted him. So let's, let's see, um, you know, if any of those are answer choices. A, the result of his lifelong struggles against madness. Okay. So this is kind of where I was talking about in the passage where y'all can start to think that Dolly is like actually mad himself. So he's not actually, you know, crazy or anything like that. He's doing this all on purpose. So that's not the right answer. B says the sort of action in which most surrealists indulged. So this is trying to say that he was going hand in hand with most of the surrealists of the time, and that's also not true. C, necessary for artistic and publicity reasons. So that's exactly what they were saying up in that like uh, third paragraph or something like that, where it was like not only was it for publicity purposes, but also to keep himself in a state of feigned madness, and so I think that's the right answer, but let's always read all of them before we mark the correct answer. D, needed to divert attention from his unskilled paintings. No, definitely. The author thought that Dolly was an incredible artist, and that was said over and over in the passage, so he's not unskilled at all. So the answer there is C. Dolly once helped create a dream sequence for the film Spellbound, a psychological thriller directed by Alfred Alfred Hitchcock, which of the following is information from the passage that best explains why Hitchcock would seek Dolly's assistance. Okay, so we're given a little bit of background information about um, this psychological thriller that is directed by Alfred Hitchcock. If you know who Alfred Hitchcock is, I feel like it kind of makes this question a little bit easier, um, but overall, you don't have to know. We're told that it's a dream sequence and that 
it's a psychological thriller. So we should be able to kind of draw a comparison as to why that Hitchcock would want to kind of recruit Dolly for something like this. Um, A says Dolly became part of surrealism to gain wider recognition. So I don't think, honestly, let's go back and, and look because I remember where it is. Um, he flung himself into surrealism with complete abandonment. So he was giving them their most extreme interpretation. Was he doing it for wider recognition? I don't know. I don't have passage evidence to say that, so I'm not going to pick an answer that says that. Dolly's madness was greatly appreciated by the public. So probably not, right? Because we were told that the public kind of thought he was crazy and the surrealist kind of thought he was crazy. Um, you know, people that liked art kind of understood what he was doing, I think. But like, I wouldn't say the public greatly appreciated his madness. Uh, C, Dolly was a dedicated artist. Um, probably, yeah. Um, but I don't think that really explains why um, Hitchcock would want him for this dream sequence. Like Hitchcock could have picked, oh my gosh, I'm going to like out myself for not knowing any other artist. But he could have picked like any other artist, you know, that was dedicated. It didn't have to be Dolly. So um, I don't like that one either. D, Dolly created art based on images from the subconscious. So I think that's true. Um, it talked a little bit about those psychopathological states and, um, and just the madness he had to keep himself in. I've said that like five billion times, but like it's the main idea. Um, so I think that that's both a true statement and it explains the question stem why Hitchcock would want Dolly because he did have kind of like a eccentric, avant-garde kind of approach to art. And so Hitchcock wanted him on for this project. Given the information in the passage, one would most reasonably assume that surrealism tries to. Okay, so now it's basically saying, like, what is surrealism? Like, what does it represent? Um, so probably, again, something that Dolly did. A, put hallucinations and dreamlike visions on canvas. Okay, I can kind of see this. It talked about Dolly hallucinating himself um, on purpose so that he could make these paintings and he could like fit in with surrealism or push the boundaries of surrealism really. So I kind of like that one. B, encourage artists to act in childlike ways in public. I don't think so. It mentioned something about like the mind of a child or the reasons that a child does X, Y, Z and, and compares it to Dolly in the passage. Um, but it wasn't Surrealism itself wasn't trying to make people act like children in public. Um, C, reflect the world as clearly as possible. I don't know what world y'all are living in, but I don't often see cauliflower just pouring out of Rolls Royces or, you know, eight feet long rolls of bread. So I don't think that it was trying to like reflect the world as clearly as possible. Again, that would be like hyperrealism or something. D, give an outlet for artists to relieve stress caused by their creativity. Um, I don't think that Dolly, you know, again, putting himself in a state of feigned madness um, is relieving his stress. Um, I think that it was kind of like that had a purpose, and that purpose was to kind of put his mind in that creative state, not to relieve stress that was caused by creativity. Um, so I don't think that's the right answer either. So A it ends up being the best answer choice there. All right, guys, thanks so much for following along with us. If you have any questions about how to formulate main ideas or, um, you know, what passages we should do next, just pop them below in the comments, hit like, and subscribe and, um, you know, go throw some cauliflower in a Rolls Royce and see what happens. Mm -hmm.